Welcome to Movement Conversations, a podcast brought to you by New Generations North America, where we spend time with disciple-making movement catalysts focusing on the core DNA of gospel movement. I'm Roy Moran, your host and the North American Regional Director at New Generations. If you're not familiar with New Generations, we work with God to establish disciple-making movements among the unreached. And we define a movement as a hundred new churches that have arisen out of four generations of disciple-making activity. As of March 2020, we're tracking 128 disciple-making movements among 655 people groups. We're currently engaged in 55 countries and 77 urban centers and affinity groups. It's our hope to share the wisdom that God has granted us in all this movement activity, as well as bring some of our friends to the table and talk about movement DNA. Thanks for joining us. Uh, Later, we'll share with you how you can take advantage of the training and coaching networks New Generations is developing in North America. But for now, uh, let's get to our guests for today. I'd like to welcome uh, to the New Generations podcast today, uh, Matthew Bates. Uh, Matthew Bates is an impressive guy. I'm a little concerned here. I'm above my uh, pay grade in in working in this podcast, but uh, Matthew holds a PhD from uh, Notre Dame University. Uh, And if you've read any of his work, he's kind of a, a maybe describes himself as a a theological mutt in some ways of all the different genres of of theology he's grown up in. Uh, But I'm especially excited today for those of us involved in the whole disciple-making movement strategy because uh, Matthew's books really do speak uh, to the the heart of what we feel like is a a strategy that God has used in in amazing ways to watch the gospel go viral. Um, I've just uh, finished reading the gospel of allegiance that Matthew wrote. Uh, He also has has written uh, another book called salvation by allegiance alone. Um, And uh, I, uh, know from reading gospel of allegiance that you're probably uh, knee deep in writing another one so um, thanks so much matthew for being here i appreciate your taking the time to speak to us hey roy thanks so much and it's it's exciting for me to get to partner with you know different people who have been doing this kind of work for many many years and uh and uh, i find myself as a latecomer into the game i suppose from a more academic end uh but i'm grateful to yeah to, to chat with you and uh, partner with with folks like you well, you know, I'm, I'm sure because you're a professor of theology, you know, at Quincy University, you you have a chance to really uh, soak in this stuff. But um, on a day to day basis, uh, those of us out here who are attempting to, uh, you know, involve ourselves in calling our friends and neighbors uh, into a relationship with God, uh, this idea of obedience has played a huge role for us. Um, maybe could you just describe um, how how you've come to this or or your, your perspective on it? Yeah, well, um, I guess speaking more specifically about the obedience angle, um, one of the things that was interesting to me as I began to study what the gospel was in more detail, and especially the gospel's purpose, right? Paul speaks about the gospel's purpose as the obedience of faith, right? And mm-hmm. um, what does that language mean, the obedience of faith? Um, so I I spent a number of years um, turning that phrase over, I guess, reading um, different scholarly monographs uh, as I was doing doctoral work on Paul's letters. Um, uh, Garlington's um, has a whole huge book on that phrase, the obedience of faith, for instance, um, and, and thinking through, um, yeah, uh, that as it meets the church um, was, a, was a lengthy process. So one of the things that I noticed, though, is that um, the purpose of the gospel as the obedience of faith is certainly something that uh, has been neglected historically in the North American church, um, that um, that somehow the obedience part got left behind, <laughs> mm-hmm. right? Uh, and that people just wanted to talk about faith. Um, so some of my work is, um, is trying to position the church to recover the obedience angle and the faith angle and keep them together uh, by using language of allegiance that I think is actually very faithful to scripture. We'll, we'll obviously get into that more, I'm sure. So, yeah, I, I love that idea, you know, because um, obedience uh, in many ways is, is often seen as legalism and in that classic, you know, argument uh, about, you know, lordship salvation versus sort of a free grace, uh, however you, you say it, and those kinds of things. Um, you're not really siding on either 
side of that. I don't think, uh, as I understand, you're, you're maybe charting a third course in, in that argument. I think that's fair to say that there's, um, that if I was to choose one side or the other, free grace versus lordship salvation, I'm very squarely on the lordship salvation side mm-hmm. of things. Uh, but I also think there's some problems with how um, those who have been championing lordship salvation have articulated their the position and how they would talk about how faith and work should relate. So, of course, within the lordship salvation camp, um, the big name would be John MacArthur, mm-hmm. right, as um, the one who um, wrote a couple books. And I think they're helpful books um, on, the, uh, I think, one is the gospel according to Jesus or something mm-hmm. like that. Um, and, um, you know, and these these books, I think, did a very effectively show that the free grace position um, has some problems. Now, the free grace position um, is uh, uh, the idea that you don't need to do anything other than just believe that Jesus died for my sins mm-hmm. and um, that and that, that believing involves the trust, of course, they would want to say. Um, it's not just like a mere belief, because even the demons can believe, um, but that nothing else would be required of us, certainly not obedience or anything like that. That would be legalism. And MacArthur combated that by saying, no, it's, it's lordship, um, and we need to affirm that Jesus is Lord. Um, the concern that I have, I guess, with um, both frameworks is that they both seem to make assumptions about what faith means that's a little bit deficient. They both tend to land faith on trust. And what do we trust? We trust that Jesus' sacrifice is effective. That's what we need to do. We need to trust that like whatever whatever Jesus was doing on the cross, it worked for us and, our, and for our salvation. Now, that's true. It did work, and it is effective for our salvation, but that that there's maybe a misunderstanding of what the gospel is and how faith gets targeted. That's part of what needs to be repositioned and repackaged there. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that word trust is, is an interesting word. I want, I want to try something out on you and you sort of uh, take me to the theological woodshed here uh, for a moment and see if it works. But, you know, when I think of, 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 you know, pistis, the word trust, and it's off, you know, faith or belief and trust, you know, it, it, it has that, that variety of things. But when you get from the Greek language to the English language, and you just simply, you know, move it into that uh, faith or trust or, 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 or even belief, uh, trust, it seems to be stronger in the English language. And, it, and even if you define trust as, as um, acting as if it were true, you know, so if I'm trusting in, in uh, if I came to trust the Jesus, you know, I would act as if his words were true uh, and I would do them. So it, it fits in the great commission, you know, where it says, you know, Jesus says, teach them all, you know, to obey all that I've commanded. Mm-hmm. Um, is that is that concept of trust anywhere near what you're thinking about in terms of allegiance or how would it be different? Yeah. Well, so trust, I think does um, uh, involve believing certain things to be true, right? I'm not going to like act unless I like have a certain kind of belief structure in there. So it involves mental cognitive things, right. Um, That are affirmed and trust does involve, you know, um, yeah, like a, a, an acting on or a commitment toward, like there's a relational dimension to it. Um, what seems to be missing is any kind of bodily dimension, or it's not necessarily implied in trust. Now, it could be, um, but a, a allegiance and loyalty seems to involve the body more and a posture of loyalty to a person in a way that trust Trust doesn't involve like title as much as allegiance does. Allegiance makes it clear like um, that Jesus is the king and that that the way my trust is oriented is toward a posture of obedient loyalty to this king. Right? Mm-hmm. Whereas if I trust Jesus as Lord um, and uh, really like what I'm saying as part of that is that I, I think that I, I believe that his work on my behalf is effective and that I need to trust in some way that his guidance for my life is good. Um, but it doesn't involve like a strong idea of giving allegiance to the king. And I think this comes back to a distorted gospel. If we kind of like, like what's the underlying issue here? Um, the underlying issue is that, is that when the New Testament presents the gospel again and again, it focuses on Jesus as the Christ, Jesus as the king. And what has happened is that Christ uh, word has sort of just become Jesus' last name or an alternative way of referring to Jesus, but the, the significance of the title has sort of been left behind. Uh, and so that when people say, well, what I'm doing is I'm trusting in Jesus Christ, 
um, what they've meant is I'm trusting that Jesus died for my sins. When I think the New Testament emphasis is that like what it means to respond to the gospel is to give loyalty or allegiance to Jesus as the king. And of course, on that path to becoming king, he did many things. He took on human flesh. He died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures on the cross. He, he was buried. He was raised, right? Uh, he has resurrection life. And that as part of that process, then he eventually was enthroned at God's very right hand. Um, but that last bit, the enthronement, is what gets left out of the gospel, right? Um, but I think it's actually um, not only central to the gospel in the New Testament, but it's where most of the climactic energy lands in the New Testament, whenever we look at what the New Testament teaches about the gospel. So that's really the, the, the where I think lordship salvation isn't strong enough. It, it really made the focus of the gospel justification by faith, but believing Jesus's atonement was effective, trusting that it was effective, rather than giving loyalty to the king. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, the argument, you know, that, that comes back that I have experienced, and I'm sure you have too, is that uh, how is this not legalism? You know, how, how is it not, you know, violating the very, you know, nature of the book of Galatians, for instance, and, and the idea of the law being, you know, part of, of, of being, you know, your salvation and stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a, a, a huge question and gets us into a lot of deep theological territory real fast. Um, but yeah, in, in terms of the legalism question specifically, I think that um, we should recognize that Jesus calls people to an overall relational posture of loyalty. Um, and that doesn't mean that there are, um, I guess the way to say it would be quantifiable or um, specific written kind of commands that he gives each person as a list of rules, right? Mm -hmm. So allegiance to Jesus the King, if I say I give my loyalty to Jesus the King, that doesn't mean that Jesus as King is absolutely commanding me, Matthew Bates, to X, Y, Z, and D, um, and commanding you, Roy, to X, Y, Z, and D, the exact same things, right? Loyalty to Jesus might call you in one direction and me in another, uh, because we have different life contexts. Mm -hmm. Now, there might be a core to that that involves um, a certain kind of um, obedience to Jesus that no matter wh who you are as a disciple of Jesus, he's going to call us to a certain kind of holiness. Right? It's not a legalism because it's relationally oriented, um, as it's, it's about giving loyalty to him rather than keeping the rule. Um, but nevertheless, right, um, he's going to call various disciples to various things that aren't really quantifiable or rule-oriented in that kind of way. Okay. So, uh, you know, obviously the allegiance has nothing to do um, with gaining the, the, the relationship with Jesus. Is, is it more confirming in that sense? Is that it's the, the quality of my belief that leads to the allegiance? Is that, am I reading that right or straight? Yeah. I, I don't know that we could separate them out. I don't know that we could separate out like belief trust and allegiance in terms of how the New Testament wants to talk about it in a very clean way, because those words all actually are connected to the pistis word group in New Testament. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that's like, like easiest to misunderstand from people who only read Bible and English language rather than the original is that the word pistis is a lot richer um, than our word like trust or faith, because it involves faithfulness mm -hmm. or trustworthiness or loyalty or allegiance. The word faith itself, right, that we tend to think about is like believing or maybe even believing without evidence or maybe trusting. Uh, in Greek, it actually is kind of double-sided. It means that. It means all those things. Um, so that's the one side of the, of the coin of faith. Uh, but the other side of the coin is faithfulness, which is quite different, right? If I was to say like, you know, um, well, I'm saved by my faithfulness to Jesus, not my faith in Jesus. Mm -hmm. um, that sounds to us like a very different idea in English mm -hmm. um, than it than um, like, yeah, in Greek, not so. Mm -hmm. Right. In Greek, like the word pistis actually carries both. Mm -hmm. It carries both faith and faithfulness simultaneously. So when it says in the New Testament that you're saved by, you know, by, by grace through faith, like we should realize that word, it, it, it could equally be understood. I'm saved by grace through faithfulness. To Jesus, mm -hmm. right? So we tend to like subtract out that faithfulness part, partly because it doesn't fit our underlying theologies very well. Like we have to wrestle more deeply with our whole theological package, right? To be able to make sense mm -hmm. of faithfulness. Um, but we need to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, our, our uh, theological frameworks oftentimes inform the text rather than text informing our frameworks. And 
you know, it, it, people have a hard time seeing that in the midst of this argument because it's a bit heated at times. You know, people feel like they're defending um, the, the, the very nature of the gospel uh, because you said faithfulness, you know, and it's like, oh, my gosh, you know, you have you have perverted the gospel. Um, how, how do you how, how do you you know, move people around that in a sense. I mean, I, I know, I, I you know, I, I have a bachelor's degree in Greek, so I, I, I get the idea of what you're talking about there, but I hate to pull the Greek card on people, you know, yeah, and sure. say, well, if you just understood pistis, you know, you, you know, yeah. you, you need to look in, you know, a couple of, of resources here and you can learn that. How, how do you yeah. argue people, you know, around that in terms of just English language speakers and, you know, ordinary people? Yeah. Um, well, I think you can um, uh, certainly talk about faith and faithfulness, because even in English, the word faith involves, you know, like um, ideas of fidelity, for instance, like, you know, um, we it's a little bit archaic, but it's like, I, you know, like I, we could say I broke faith with my wife, like if I cheated on her or something like, mm -hmm. you know, it involves ideas of fidelity or faithfulness or trustworthiness. Right. So I think we can help people get it in just purely in English without like pulling the Greek card. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. If we need to do some more heavy hitting kind of reconstruction, it is maybe good to work through Galatians because that is oftentimes the objection that people have as Paul talks about, you know, I'm astonished that, you know, you were so quickly deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, um, which is no, really no gospel at all. Paul wants to say, of course. <laughs> right. Um, and, um, and as we work really carefully through um, what Paul says about the the gospel, um, we have to look at like, well, where does Paul define the gospel? Like what, what exactly is the gospel? And when we go back to those core texts where Paul most clearly defines the gospel, um, it actually has a slightly different shape and structure than most people think. Um, some of the most important passages would be clearly 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 5, where he talks not about Jesus dying for my sins, but about the Christ doing certain things, like the king does things, mm -hmm. right? So we have to realize that salvation and our forgiveness comes through kingship, right? It's the, it's the Christ or the king, you know, who... Um, who, you know, died for our sins, you know, in accordance with the scriptures, was buried, was raised on the third day. Um, and of course, the king is Jesus. Uh, but Paul's point in context, right, is that the king did this for us. And so we need to be thinking about, like, how the gospel has that kind of king royal shape. Another really important text is Romans 1, 2 through 4, where Paul talks about how the gospel was promised in advance. And that this gospel actually pertains to uh, the son. And this son was born uh, or maybe came into being into the line of David. Uh, and then Paul qualifies that and says, well, I'm only talking about his flesh. Right. Uh, when, I, when I talk about him coming into being, he preexisted in some other way. Right. And then he goes on from there and talks about how this uh, the, the resurrection of Jesus from the dead triggered his exaltation uh, so that he started out as the son, uh, the eternal son of God. But that after his resurrection, he assumes a new office. He becomes the son of God in power and begins to rule over all creation. So once we see that the shape of the gospel involves incarnation, Jesus taking on human flesh in the line of David, and also enthronement, him coming to be seated at the right hand of God, uh, we realize like, well, maybe Paul's gospel is actually about how Jesus became king, right? Or it's about him in his royal capacity in ways that we're not appreciating. So as we, uh, as we then take those insights to Galatians, right? And we realize that the gospel is really about how Jesus became king and delivers us from this evil era that Paul mentions in Galatians, right? That that's why the son is sent is to rescue us from this present evil age, he says in Galatians 1.4, right? Um, and then um, he begins to talk about uh, the perversion of the gospel. Um, probably part of the perversion has to do then with uh, the result of the gospel, right? That um, the result of the gospel is actually to create one justified or righteous family with God. Uh, and that the Galatians, by doing these works of the law, um, they, they're, they're actually showing that those results are invalid. Um, so we can do some reconstructive work in theology on Galatians and talk about what the perversion of the gospel really is. Is it a perversion of the gospel in the terms of its content or in terms of its application? Mm -hmm. um, I think that if we, if we read Paul with care, we'll see that it involves especially application, mm -hmm. that that's where Paul is deeply concerned. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't want to belabor the point in Galatians, but I think it's 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 really uh, you know critical there that that distinction you're making is that a lot of people would tend to think that the Galatians uh, were were attempting to 
earn their salvation by this new gospel, but yet they were morally going reverting backwards to a former way of life. Uh, I mean, is that is that kind of that's absolutely right? Yeah, Paul talks about that in um, with regard to like the elementary, like fundamental building blocks of the universe, the Stoicheia, and says like, you know, like now that you freed yourself from these, like how could you go back? You're reverting to childhood, mm -hmm. uh, is the analogy he uses in Galatians chapter four, mm -hmm. right? And Paul says the only thing that matters is new creation. Like you have been created afresh because you've been brought into this new epic through the King, uh, and that's all that matters. He says at the end of Galatians is this new creation that's been unleashed um, and that we get to participate in through the king sending the spirit. Mm -hmm. um, so that's really the logic of Galatians has to do with, um, yeah, like um, especially the idea that like by being obedient to works of the Torah, the idea wasn't necessarily to earn salvation, but was to demonstrate um, that like the, the point in doing that was to demonstrate that I'm more righteous than you are. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and yeah. Paul says, no, no, there's only one righteous family. Right. There's only one righteous family, and that's the justified family. Mm -hmm. We'll get back to our guests in just a minute, but I wanted to share with you how you could access some of the New Generations resources. If you go to newgenerations.org, you can keep up with New Generations and its global efforts around the world by jumping on the mailing list, getting regular updates about what God is doing. We house resources for disciple making movements at disciplemakingmovements.com. And we keep our North American friends together at newgenerations.us and newgenerations.ca. Don't rewind to get all that. Uh, it'll be in the show notes. Or you can take a look at newgenerations.us. Look for the podcast, and all that information will be there. So uh, you um, you use the, the idea of justification and, and really... Um, I know that uh, uh, some some uh, sectors of, of uh, the theological framework have taken you and Scott McKnight to task, you know, for for taking on justification as not being the center of gravity, you know, of the gospel, but it's, it being someplace else. Um, you mm -hmm. want to explain that to us? Sure. Um, yeah, there has been some conversation over that. Um, I think you're referring to the, especially like the, um, the kind of more public um, back and forth between Greg <laughs> Gilbert and Scott yeah. and I. Yeah. Um, yeah um, so, uh, yeah, really one of the things that's interesting, if you if you like to do a word search on the word gospel, euangelion uh, and gospel language, you'll find that Paul, no, like nowhere in the New Testament, not Paul, not anyone else ever says that justification by faith is part of the gospel. Um, that's actually something that Luther said. Um, but that was sloppy. Um, there's something more precise. Um, actually, when we read with care, Romans 1, 16 through 17, Paul talks about the gospel being the power of God for salvation because it reveals the righteousness of God. Now, that's different uh, um, because what it means is that the righteousness of God, uh, if we understand that to be our justification or our right standing, it means that it's actually a benefit of the gospel, which is not the same as the gospel. Mm -hmm. um, we need to be careful about that uh, because Paul says it unveils unveils the righteousness of God, I think the way in which it unveils it is as a benefit of the gospel. So one way of putting it would be to say this, that the gospel is that Jesus is the king. Right now, if I affirm that, if I start giving my allegiance to Jesus, I confess that he is indeed the king and I submit my life to him, um, which is what the gospel calls us to do, right? Well, then what flows from that as a benefit is that I do have right standing with God because God sends the Holy Spirit and then I'm incorporated into the family that has the Holy Spirit and is the justified family. The justified family exists before you or I are born. There are already people who are justified. Like we get the chance to join it. So there's a kind of a community first dimension to justification that I think um, can sometimes um, get sidelined in these kinds of discussions that make salvation seem as if it's all about me and God. Mm -hmm. right, what I need is I need to get right with God. Well, that's true, you do. But the way you get right with God is by, first of all, God giving a king, right? You give your loyalty to the king, and the king has a people that you get to join that is the justified family. Mm -hmm. And once you join it, then you personally are justified. But it's not about a personal transaction for you that is somehow apart from that community. And I think that that's where um, there's some slippage um, and that Scott and I are really wanting to say, it's King Jesus first, right? Uh, it's King Jesus first. We have to like, 
the, 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 the gospel is not about justification by faith. The, the gospel is about affirming that Jesus is the king and he died for all of our sins, right? C- creating a people of God that we then have the opportunity to join as the king pours out his benefits. So I, I know this is uh, not necessarily a direction that, that you've taken in your, your writings, but as you're talking, it, it really does challenge the conventional uh, idea of gospeling or, or evangelization or evangelism uh, because most presentations of evangelism in modern Christianity are, are really cross centric uh, yes. in that nature or, or justification by faith centric in that sense. Yes. Um, how, how would you change the presentation of the gospel? Yeah. Instead of asking people to trust that Jesus died for them on the cross, right? I would say, Instead, give allegiance to Jesus as the king who died for you on the cross, mm-hmm. right? And that the results that happen on the cross will be yours as a benefit. Mm-hmm. So it's, um, it's still cross-like like centric in the sense that the cross is still essential, yeah. right? It's, it's just putting Jesus as King, like at the climactic center of the gospel presentation, mm-hmm. because our forgiveness or our justification flows as a benefit from what the King has done. Mm-hmm. So it's a, it's really um, what, what has happened has, I think in a lot of American evangelical, like kind of culture that's been exported all around the world mm-hmm. uh, is to kind of create a self-centered parody of the gospel. Right, the self-centered parody of the gospel is this: that I have a sin problem, and I need uh, I need that taken care of somehow, so I don't go to hell, right? And that so then what I need to do is I need to trust that God provided a mechanism to help me out, like Jesus as the substitute. I trust the mechanism works, uh, and then I'm good to go. Okay, then I I, I I'm on my way to heaven. Um, like that's a self-centered parody of the gospel because it really focuses around like the salvation of the self so that the self can experience some sort of heavenly delight. It's Mm -hmm. all about the self getting something for the self, Mm -hmm. right? Um, The real gospel calls us to be cross-shaped, right? It calls us to be disciples of Jesus. And it says, no, actually God doesn't want to just rescue you from something, your sins. He wants to do that so that you can do something for him Mm -hmm. because you need to be his image in the world and that God wants you to be a cross-shaped image bearer so that you look like him, so that you can serve the world like he does. Mm -hmm. So not so that you can experience the delights of heaven, but so that you can actually experience the suffering of the cross because you'll find that that's actually the way to true life. Mm-hmm. It's a, it's self-centered, but uh, in the sense that you indeed are rescued from punishment and, and that you're saved, mm-hmm. right? But it, it's self-centered in the sense that you have to lose the self to become other-centered, mm-hmm. right? In a way that the parody of the gospel just completely misses. Mm-hmm. Um, so we have to get back to the real gospel of Jesus's kingship and how, how it's a cross-shaped kingship, mm-hmm. right? Um, but, but yeah, it's not about the salvation of the self so the self can experience delights. It's about the salvation of the self so the self can serve God in a cross-shaped way. That's mm-hmm. totally different. Mm-hmm. Totally different. Yeah. You know, and unfortunately, uh, for centuries, you know, we, we not only have developed that uh, me-centered gospel, but we've exported it you know, yeah. to the entire world. Um, and, and part of, you know, I think one, one of the, maybe the geniuses that, that we've at New Generations find is that uh, when we start with people in that pre, pre-Christian phase and we get them to look at God's word and we ask them um, in, in a, what we would refer to as discovery Bible study or dis, a discovery group where we'd say, um, you know, read this, let's read this passage. What does it say about God? What does it say about man? What does it say about the life he wants us to live? What are you going to do about it? You know, and, and call them to a small step of obedience. It, it sort of takes that, uh, that moment of um, sort of crisis conversional a strategy that would call people to pray a prayer or do something. And it spreads it out, you know, over a, a longer period of time. And it says, uh, are you willing to have allegiance, you know, to this King and, and to his kingdom? Um, and we feel like in some ways, and maybe you could respond to this, you know, when Jesus comes on the scene, uh, the, the first thing we see him doing um, is calling his uh, disciples who have a, probably at that point, no clue who he is. They know he's profound, but they don't really know the substance of his profoundness. He calls them by saying, follow me. 
I mean, an, an act of obedience in a sense, or an act of allegiance in that sense. Is that, does that fit in the vein of what you're talking about? Yeah, absolutely. I like what you're saying because I think one of the dangers of, um, yeah, the way that the gospel has been presented is it's been presented as almost like a mental thing only, right? As um, like a lot of traditional American evangelical culture has presented the gospel as like, what you need to do is trust, which is something you do with your mind. And oh, like, don't use your body, actually, because that would be a work. Um, <laughs> yeah, I really think that like, yeah, Jesus, Jesus gets that what faith means is something that involves all of us. It's a whole, it's a holistic response, mind, body, spirit, however you want to package the human, it involves all of us, right? Right. Um, and so I think we want to not see faith as disembodied. Um, and that's why I think we can see it as, yeah, an, an allegiance kind of response to Jesus. Jesus is when he says to follow. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, it's, it's a form of, of, of um, yeah, of, of using the body as a way of um, definitively expressing that loyalty or that allegiance or that pistis, that faith. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't want to theologically nerd out here, but for a moment, I, I, it, when I think about this, uh, I think about the arguments around the ordo salutis, you know, the order mm -hmm. of salvation, mm -hmm. what comes first, what comes second, you know, and those kinds of things. Um, th this, this argument sort of sits in there in, in terms of, of dealing with that, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Yeah, yeah. You're um you're anticipating my next book, which um, is going to deal with this a lot more thoroughly. Uh -oh. But yeah, the the traditional ordo salutis, right, is wanted to say like what God does is first he you know he chooses people before time began individually, right. This would be a very Calvinist sort of way of looking at just generally speaking, right. And then uh, in time, like God justifies those people, and then he simultaneously sanctifies them. Uh, there's a kind of a, a logical, but not a chronological ordering to that. So they would say like, well, those things can be logically distinguished, but really they're happening at the same time. We're justified and we're sanctified. And then eventually we'll be glorified. Um, the problem is all those terms are individualized in inappropriate ways, uh, according to what Paul's actually teaching in context. Paul's actually teaching about something that's group oriented. Um, and he's talking about the whole people of God being justified, sanctified, glorified, and he's not trying to just divide out an individualized process like that. So yeah, it does have bearing on all that. Um, and, uh, when you get right down to it, actually, the, the whole division between justification and sanctification that's important to the ordo salutis um, is, uh, is actually something that I don't think can very easily demonstrated from scripture. Mm -hmm. um, I think that it's a, um, yeah, like whenever you read, for instance, Romans 8, uh, 29 and through 30, that uh, where we have the traditional ordo salutis passage, it doesn't mention sanctification. Um, that's something that's sort of been inserted in, into systematic theologies. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think that there's actually a, a, not a real distinction between justification and sanctification within an individual salvation. Mm -hmm. um, it does. So anyway, this conversation does have bearing on all of this. You're right. Um, to unpack it all is, yeah, is, is a major task. Yeah. Um, but yes, you're, you're on the right track. So I, I, when I think about this, um, you know, it, I don't know if this is too simplistic or not, but uh, it, it's almost like what you're talking about. Um, and you've used the term careful reading several times um, that, uh, you know, we, we sit on the Greek mind side of the world. And so we want to particulate things, uh, divide them, define them and stuff. Uh, and yet the scriptures was mostly written you know, on the Hebrew side, more of a unified mm -hmm. world yeah. um, that, that wouldn't really um, be that concerned about things being so mixed together and, and you're not being able to depart, you know, part them out so, mm -hmm. so clearly. And I hear a little bit of that in your, as you define things and point us back to the scriptures. I mean, does that Greek Hebrew mindset help explain a little bit of, of the trouble that we've got ourselves into over the probably, um, I think the biggest trouble, frankly, is like is sort of like a loss of the sense of the collective, like that God is trying to like create a people, mm -hmm. right? Um, that he's he's setting apart a people for himself and we as individuals get to participate in it. Mm -hmm. um, but like short circuiting that and failing to see how like God's creation of a people is the intermediate term and in how individuals come to be saved, mm -hmm. right? That like we are saved whenever we 
participate in the people who are being saved, mm-hmm. um, which is what, like it's why, why the church matters, right? Among many, many, many reasons. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, but a, but a failure to do serious business with that as a genuine middle term, right? In our salvation, um, I think is is a deep problem. So we are saved individually, but we're saved individually by being plugged into the group that's being saved. Um, and so when we don't when we w- within our salvation systems, whenever we we try to move to like say like, well, what does God do for the individual, <laughs> right? And we and we and we and we we want to talk about what God does for the individual apart from how that connects to the group. That's where we really get in trouble. Mm-hmm. Um, that's that's I guess the easiest way I put my my finger on what I think the problem is. So uh, this is this is veering off into the ditch a little bit, but uh, I I know that being a professor, having a degree from a Catholic university and being a professor at a Catholic university and using that kind of language, uh, you, you might get criticism about uh, you, you've been influenced by Catholic theology by thinking mm. too much about the body, you know, as opposed to about the individual. Um, but, but, but yet the scripture does, you know, really talk about, you know, God collecting a new community. Yeah. Uh, you know, he, he started a family and his, his family abused him. And now he's been about recollecting that family um, and uh, allowing that family, you know, that he's collected to be a part of finding their yet not yet brothers and sisters to be a part and enjoy that family. Uh, yeah. So- yeah. Well, I, I think, yeah, sometimes there are people who have said that I, you know, unduly influenced by my Catholic, you know, training or whatever, but um but I also have a pretty sharp criticism of Catholicism in my work as well. Um, so I think there's an appropriate, I hope, critique of some traditional Protestant theology and traditional Catholic theology as mm-hmm. I think we're genuinely still trying to like work together toward the truth. I'm, I don't know that I have all the answers. Um, I'm just trying to do my best to answer them from scripture. Uh, and yeah, that would always be my response is like, yes, yeah, show me from scripture, right? Let's, let's work through the scripture with care together. Yeah. Um, and um, yeah, I, I appreciate my Catholic brothers and sisters, my Protestant brothers and sisters. I, of course, am Protestant, um, but uh, yeah, it's it's a rich conversation with the Orthodox as well. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. okay, uh, super. So um, you know, at New Generations, uh, you know, in the strategy that I talked about before, um, you know, in in terms of having the the pre Christian or the non Christian or however you might want to re- refer to them, uh, look at God's word, and and then be asked to um to respond to that mm-hmm. uh you know and, and and to respond to it by and usually i mean at the ground level we would say um develop an i will statement if this is god speaking i will do this this week and it, it will be so, something that uh is maybe different for you than me and you know it, it's an application mm-hmm. that is just god inspired in that sense from this passage um so uh, people will criticize, you know, uh, saying, well, 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 non-Christians can't obey God. You know, non-Christians can't, can't do that. I mean, can you, can you speak to that? Is that, is that true or is it not true? Or from your um, perspective, what would you say? Yeah. Well, I think that's a, that's a, certainly I would want to say that, yeah, people who are non-Christian certainly can obey God. I mean, the question would be like, whether they can, they ultimately please God for their salvation apart from Christ? Well, no, mm-hmm. but does that mean they can't make a step toward of obedience toward Christ? I mean, that would be contrary to everything we find in the new Testament, right? The new Testament consistently puts forward um, our salvation decision as a human decision, mm-hmm. right? Um, ideas, like sometimes you'll hear people say things like faith is purely receptive or things like that. Like it's only a received gift from God. Mm -hmm. Um, Again, that's just not how the Bible prefers to speak about faith. Um, Show me where the Bible says that faith is purely received from God. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can maybe pull out some vague proof text and say like, well, every good gift comes from God or things like that. Um, but that's just not how the Bible prefers to speak about faith. It's all, it's consistently presented as the human response mm-hmm. uh, that we, we can genuinely take initiative for. Um, so I would, I would certainly be in the free will camp that would see um, God as ordaining humans with a certain free will capacity where we can respond to God. Now we can't respond perfectly to God or in a 
uh, a way that um, would please God apart from Christ, but God has provided the essentials for our salvation already. Mm-hmm. Um, I, the gospel itself is the gift that we need in order to be saved. Mm-hmm. I think it's there's misunderstandings of grace that are often being packaged in there, right? Saying like, well, God in his graciousness has to like zap you with some regenerating energy uh, would be what people like, you know, on a certain certain circles might say. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think that's true, nor can that idea be supported from scripture. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that it would be more true to say, you know what, God has zapped all, all humanity, indeed all creation with some new creation energy. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's, it's in fact, God sending the son mm-hmm. as an act of new creation. The resurrection is a, his first act of new creation. The sending of the Holy Spirit is his new creation power. God has unleashed new creation forces in the world, mm-hmm. right? And um, through these new creation forces, God's grace is sufficiently available for us to respond to it with um, the allegiance that's necessary. So that, that just prompts me, you know, another bullet point here that hits me is like, okay, so if that's true, um, you know, and I'm sure you've heard this before, you know, how, how does a dead person make themselves alive? You know, um, it, you know, so, you know, Paul said we were dead in our trespasses and sins, you know, and we are made alive. God makes us alive. And, um, uh, and I think maybe the, the the way to answer that question is just ask you about uh, Ephesians two, you know, eight, nine, and ten. In that sense, is that the gift of faith there, you know, that not of yourselves. Can you unpack that for us? Yeah. Um, so, in in terms of how we get plugged in again, I would want to say like, how does a dead person become alive? Well, we make an allegiance decision and then we're, we are then um, like, if we confess Jesus Christ as Lord, we're part of the body that has the Holy Spirit and God's new creation power is at work there. Mm -hmm. Um, In terms of Ephesians, um, the Ephesians 2, um, 8 through 10 passage, um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot to say about that. The whole whole last chapter of gospel allegiance, you know, um, sort of unpacks uh, Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. Um, so, yeah, there's there's a lot that 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 needs to be said to kind of work through that properly. But because I think it's like on the one hand, it's like there's misunderstandings of grace, right? When it says for, um, for by grace you've been saved, um, we can divide grace into different kinds of um, graces, mm-hmm. right? Um, in context, Paul actually mentions God's grace already, um, as uh, Paul has already talked about it in Ephesians two, uh, and sp- he speaks about um, uh, by grace you've been saved, uh, especially in connection with our enthronement at God's right hand and things like that. Um, but, um, but Paul, um, when he's talking about by grace, you've been saved, I would understand that to be primarily a reference to the gospel itself. Like God has given the gospel. And I think you could support that from Ephesians. Uh, and then when it says through faith, like, well, we tend to read that as like our faith in Jesus. Like we need to have faith in him as, uh, and uh, interestingly, the word can mean by, by grace you're saved through faithfulness. And it might be actually talking about not our faith in Jesus, but Jesus's faithfulness on our behalf. Mm. Um, both of those possibilities are in play and commentaries actually um, uh, that are written by professional scholars side either direction on that. Um, so um, we certainly do need to commit ourselves to Jesus as King, but in Ephesians two, eight through 10, is that even what's in view? Uh, that's open to question. Um, so uh, yeah, anyway. Um, and then when Paul talks about works, I think in that passage, it's clear as he continues on, he's talking about works of law, mm-hmm. right? Um, as Paul moves um, to speaking about circumcision immediately after that, mm-hmm. right? And how um, works of law like circumcision um, can divide the one family of God into more than one family and how that's not possible because God has broken down the wall uh, that divided Jew and Gentile. So Paul seems to be talking about works of law when he's talking about works um, there. So yeah, I think there are ways in which um, um, that passage fits, uh, uh, I think, perfectly within the gospel allegiance model. Mm -hmm. So I I know we could spend all afternoon here because I could just keep bouncing around, but I'll ask you one more question. um, And and this is more of a a methodological question because you've mentioned several times the phrase careful reading of scripture. Mm -hmm. So so for you, uh, what does that entail? What, What does it look like to have a careful reading of scripture? Well, context is king, right? As uh, we always want to be very careful to pay attention to the surrounding context. Um, you know, scripture is best approached in the original languages. And they, although we don't want to pull the Greek card, um, nevertheless, um, we do need to respect scholars who do read in the original languages and their insights. Um, so, yeah, I think that it involves um, paying attention to the ancient background, like the ancient context, like God gave us 
his revealed world word in history, right? And we have to take the historical location of that word seriously. Um, I think a good principle to remember is that um, that the scripture is always God's word to me personally, but it's always God's word to me through it being God's word to other people first. Like when Paul's writing to the Romans, he's writing to real people. Like uh, anything, any way in which I, I, I could make it God's word to me that doesn't take seriously how it had to be God's word to them first is usually dangerous. It's usually going to be a mistake. If I can't make sense of God's word as God's word to them mm-hmm. before it becomes God's word to me, then I've, I've short-circuited the process. Mm-hmm. So I think that's really important as we're reading scriptures to say like, um, when this was God's word to the original audience, you know, um, who received this letter or who uh, first read this gospel, um, it was God's word to them. How can it also be God's word to me through it being God's word to them? Um, and I think that helps prevent us from reading in ways that like don't respect history uh, and don't respect context and to help us to realize we're part of a larger thing God's doing. Right, that it's not all about me. It's about how God's addressing other people too, and He's addressing me. Um, but it has to be a, a word that can address all of us, I think, or else we we probably fall short. Um, there's there's much much more that could be said about you know how to read Scripture, but those are a couple of things that come to mind yeah. immediately. Yeah, you know the when you're reading Ephesians two just a few moments ago and looking at you know for by grace you've been saved through faith and you're dealing with the word faith here it was interesting to me um, when you use, you know, by faithfulness and, and looking at, you know, whether that's my faithfulness or God's faithfulness or Jesus's faithfulness to his calling as, you know, as the anointed one. Um, how, how is it you keep your theological framework? And I know you've, you, you've, you know, self-admitted that your the, theology, theological uh, heritage is, is, is kind of a, a windy road. And I'm sure that's helpful to you, you know, mm-hmm. in, in reading the scriptures and hearing, you know, directly from it, rather than letting, you know, a reformed or dispensational or covenantal or, you know, whatever framework, you know, you might come from, from coming to them. How do you keep, you know, a, a framework from coloring how you see the scriptures? Well, I'm sure there are frameworks that color. Um, I think you've, you've put your finger on something. It is helpful to have, you know, um, to, to have experienced multiple frameworks, right? Um, where you've, you've sat uh, in different, um, well, yeah, sat intensely in different sort of settings as my undergraduate was actually at a reformed institution and the masters for the most part as well, actually, although Regent College in Vancouver, BC is pretty split. Uh, there's some reformed and non-reformed influences there. Um, and then the PhD work at Notre Dame, um, you know, beyond that, um, you know, some of the research work I've done, um, actually helped me to think through this question a lot for myself. My, my first book that I wrote was, um, actually on, um, Paul's method of scriptural interpretation. And it had to do with like, what was his, his method of scriptural interpretation when Paul interpreted the old Testament, like what framework did he bring and why? Um, and that really forced me to wrestle with the question of what frameworks do I bring and why? Um, and as I worked on that, um, I realized that Paul brings a gospel framework. Um, uh, he brings um, uh, really a framework about what the apostles proclaimed, what they preached. Uh, that's about Jesus. I mean, that's really the framework he brings about, uh, about how Jesus became the Christ. So there's a narrative that Paul seems to use that controls his way of interpreting scripture. Guess what the narrative is? It's actually the gospel. Um, it's, it's the story of how Jesus was sent by the Father, took on human flesh, died for our sins, was buried, was raised, was seen, sat at the right hand of God, will return. That's the gospel for Paul. And, and that kind of reading seems to color his Old Testament interpretation. So I've tried to, like since doing that study, tried to do the best I can to try to also have a gospel-centered framework in that way, right? Seeing that it's really the narrative about Jesus that has to be sort of the center of my interpretive enterprise. Um, that doesn't solve all the conundrums or all the problems, um, but on a, a kind of a holistic level, I, I try to keep that in mind. Yeah. Well, it, it's refreshing to hear you uh, talk about the gospel and, and move from sort of creation to consummation in that sense and understand the holistic nature of it, you know, rather than, you know, take out those uh, few moments at the cross and, and think that that is the only piece of the gospel, certainly very important, critical, crucial, couldn't do without it type, you know, piece. But, you know, Jesus came you know, not just to save us, but to involve us in his 
uh, work in this world and his family. And right. so I, it's just encouraging to hear you. Thank you. And uh, thanks for your works. Uh, can't wait to, what, what's the next one you're, you're writing now? Is it- um, well, yeah, I'll have a, a short book come out soon, um, pro- probably to be titled Gospel Precisely. Um, that would be like a very abridged version of some of the other work I've done. Okay. Um, and then the larger kind of more academic-y kind of follow-up to Gospel Allegiance, um, tentatively titled Beyond the Salvation Wars. Um, and that will be coming out with Brazos as well, the same press that did Gospel Allegiance. Okay, super. Well, Matt, thanks so much for being here today. Uh, yeah. Absolutely right. Last, I could uh, I could go all afternoon sitting here uh, well, picking your you. brain because uh, it's and, a lot of fun. Well, and I appreciate practitioners like you who you know in your wisdom have been doing this kind of work on obedience and uh, allegiance for many many years, and uh, it's exciting, and it's exciting for me to continue to learn from folks like you. So thank you. Well, thanks, man. I appreciate it. Thanks for joining us for this discussion about the DNA of gospel movements. Our hope at New Generations North America is to catalyze and nurture discovery-based disciple-making movements in North America. And we'd love for you to share this podcast with your network. Check out the resources in the show notes to pursue your journey. And join us if you'd like. If we have some resources or some tools that you can use, make sure that you take advantage of them. Thanks so much, and thanks for being here.